Good evening. My name is Derek, and I'm a community education coordinator for Boulder Community Health. Welcome to the live streamed lecture on innovative treatments for painful hips and knees. Before we begin, I need to make a few announcements. At a time when we're all asked to limit trips outside our homes, a visit to the doctor may seem out of the question. But if you have a new or ongoing health condition or develop a medical emergency, it's critical to get treatment right away, even during this pandemic. Boulder Community Health staff and facilities are prepared to treat a comprehensive range of medical issues while keeping patients protected from the COVID-19 virus. Doctor visits are available both in person and through virtual visits. Now I'd like to go over the format for the lecture. The lecture portion will last about an hour or so. Afterwards, we'll use the remaining time for questions. Please type your short question in the chat box to the right of your screen, and we'll do our best to get to it if time allows. On behalf of Boulder Community Health, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Clint Brian Blackwood. Dr. Blackwood is Boulder and Longmont's only fellowship trained hip and knee replacement specialist. He has successfully treated over 2,000 patients with hip and knee problems and specializes in minimally invasive surgical techniques for hips and knees replacements with state-of-the-art technology. He sees patients at Boulder Center for Orthopedics in Boulder. Welcome, Dr. Blackwood. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in uh, and thank you all for not coming. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, Boulder Jewish uh, Community Center uh, for setting up this live stream for us uh, during this difficult time. Um, and I am now going to give this lecture to a room with two people. So, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I am originally from Montana. I went to a small school called Carroll College uh, in Helena, Montana. I played football there uh, and then went and did medical school at the University of Washington out in Seattle. Um, we spent our first year in Montana, and it is the medical school for Montana. I then did a residency in orthopedic surgery at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, uh, and then did a fellowship uh, in joint replacement at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute in St. Helena, California, uh, in the Napa Valley, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Tom Kuhn and Adam Friedhand. I was the first surgeon with fellowship training specifically uh, in robotic arm-assisted joint replacement. I have medical licenses in Colorado and Montana, um, and I am a consultant, uh, educational consultant for Stryker Robotics. So, a little bit more about myself. Um, back when you could stand uh, closer than six feet apart from someone, uh, I came down here during the summers. I am that short little guy behind the cow. Um, I showed a cow at the Boulder County Fair. So my grandparents lived up in Longmont. Um, I spent a lot of time down here working on the farm uh, in the summers um, and actually made the front page of the Times call uh, for loading hay uh, as we were doing that uh, during the summers and spending time and earning money. Interesting tidbit about that cow that you see there. In addition to winning the blue ribbon at the County Fair, uh, she was also a twin. So they were numbered number seven and eight. Um, that would prove interesting uh, since in the last year we have had twins ourselves. So this is a little look at my family, uh, the children at least. Uh, there are five. Um, apparently going for the fourth one ended up with two. Uh, and it is their one year birthday uh, tomorrow. Uh, so a happy birthday. Shout out to them. Uh, my house is very interesting with five children not in school and on lockdown. A little bit about the practice um, and how we like to, to move in more normal times. My practice is focused on combining minimally invasive surgical techniques uh, with advanced technology. Uh, the goal is to give patients as good outcomes as we can. Uh, we want to try to improve uh, at all times and, and be consistent in our outcomes. 99% of our cases are done under a spinal anesthetic. Uh, that's healthier for the patients. It reduces their risk of postoperative complications um, and may be important moving forward. Uh, in this new uh, coronavirus environment where you don't have to be intubated um, and maybe safer for everyone from a respiratory aspect as well. Our average length of stay for knees and hips is just over a day, although more and more patients are going home the same day from surgery for both hips and knees. 90 plus percent of our patients are able to be discharged directly to home with outpatient physical therapy, uh, so they don't have to go to a rehabilitation uh, facility, they don't have to go to a skilled nursing facility, um, and so that allows them to, uh, to recover in the comfort of their own home. 
We are now uh, also four years uh, into our merger uh, for the Boulder Center for Orthopedics, but I do like to remind people that uh, we did combine. It's actually our 50th year in total practice uh, under the banner of Boulder uh, Orthopedics and Mapleton Hill Orthopedics combining uh, and forming Boulder Center for Orthopedics. Uh, we have also moved uh, to an easier access location point on the east side of town uh, across from the Boulder Toyota dealership on Pearl Parkway. I want to start at the, the beginnings of the most common cause for hip and knee pain, uh, especially in patients over 50 years of age, and just talk about what is arthritis. What, what are we talking about as the main cause for this chronic hip and knee pain that we see? Um, arthritis is the breakdown of the um, normal structures uh, of the cartilage that's in there. Uh, as you can see on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, uh, nice, white, smooth uh, cartilage. Cartilage is a very low friction substance. Uh, we have actually not recreated uh, its low friction ability in any sort of uh, man-made device. Um, as that cartilage breaks down, it goes from a nice, smooth, functioning joint uh, with no pain fibers in cartilage to exposing the bone underneath, and there's a lot of pain fibers in bone. That causes irritation, inflammation, uh, and pain in the joint uh, and leads to debilitation and decreased uh, motion uh, and activity for the patients. There's two main types of arthritis. The first is osteoarthritis, so worn out articular cartilage, that nice shiny white substance that we talked about is articular cartilage, and that starts to wear away. The cause for that can be many. It could just be bad luck. Uh, there are genetic components that people are more predisposed to arthritis. Uh, they can be post-traumatic, so after an injury, uh, there could be some damage to the cartilage. Uh, it could be after a surgery, uh, so if you've had a meniscus tear or an ACL tear that was fixed, uh, sometimes the damage of that trauma can, can contribute to some of the arthritis. There's also inflammatory arthritis. This is more of a systemic process, uh, so more than just a single joint is involved. Um, examples of this are rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, a lot of different causes and names for these. This is when the body turns against itself and starts to attack the normal tissues. Uh, the pain for this is usually worse in the morning um, and actually gets better throughout the day, whereas with osteoarthritis, usually the pain is better in the morning and gets worse throughout the day. Uh, with inflammatory arthritis, it's very well treated with multiple different medications. Uh, we see fewer and fewer patients needing to have joints replaced with inflammatory arthritis. And inflammatory arthritis also directs some of the things we need to do surgically, uh, and we can talk about that as we, we move forward. What does this look like on an x-ray? So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a nice normal knee joint. Uh, the space between the bones is not the bones levitating, that is the cartilage. Cartilage does not actually show up on x-ray, but we can tell that it's there by the space between the bones. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that that space is gone. Uh, it is now bone on bone, and that's where we get that phrase, bone on bone arthritis. There are also some cysts that have formed uh, and some bone spurs, uh, and this causes a lot of pain and discomfort for the patients, limits their mobility, uh, and can decrease their range of motion, uh, overall affecting their day-to-day their -day activities and daily life. It doesn't have to be as dramatic as that. As you can see here on the inside of the patient's knees, uh, there's bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, but the outside of the patient's knees are in good condition and good shape, so it can be localized to just isolated components and compartments of the joint. Similar to hips, the hip is a ball and socket joint, so it is a ball and cup. Uh, it is very smooth and spherical and good range of motion. Uh, but as that range of motion decreases because of the arthritis, uh, your hip joint may become less functional. So most patients who have hip arthritis more complain of a lack of motion before it becomes painful. Uh, so it becomes harder to trim your toenails, uh, harder to put your shoes and socks on, um, and that's because that underlying joint is wearing out and the capsule around that joint is thickening and causing more functional uh, discomfort. This is what that looks like on x-ray. So on the right-hand side of the screen, again, a good ball and cup. Uh, you can see that space between the, the joint there. And on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, no space between the ball and the cup. There's a giant bone spur uh, at the bottom part of that, that hip joint. Uh, and that causes a lot of pain and discomfort uh, and limits patient's mobility. Other causes for hip pain. Uh, there can be things that mimic hip pain. So there is bursitis. So more hip joint pain is in the groin. Uh, whereas bursitis pain is on the side or the outside of the hip. 
Um, it can be worse if you sleep on that side. Um, that's mainly caused from the IT band uh, running on the side of the, the bone on the femur side. Uh, back pain can radiate down toward the hip and cause some hip pain symptoms. Um, and so we will often see patients who think that they need their hip replaced and they need to have their back examined by our spine surgeon, uh, or they have uh, pain that they think is coming from their back and it's actually coming from their hip, uh, and they need to have their hip replaced rather than going to the, the uh, spine surgeon. Uh, hernias can also mimic some of this pain. So I said the hip joint pain is in the groin. Uh, hernias can also cause pain in the joint or uh, in the groin area and can mimic some pain there. Uh, I've had have a few patients who've had their hip replaced from arthritis and had residual pain and it turned out they actually had a hernia uh, that needed to be fixed as well. So unfortunately you are allowed to have more than one thing that may be causing pain in that area. Uh, so you can have arthritis and bursitis. You can have arthritis and back pain uh, and you can have arthritis and a hernia. The number of hip and knee replacements is projected to uh, increase dramatically, uh, especially in the next 10 years as the baby boomers age. Um, it's supposed to go up from you know, the turn of the century, about 500,000 uh, knee replacements and uh, 200,000 hip replacements done annually uh, to approximately 3.5 million uh, knee replacements uh, in 10 years uh, and 600,000 hip replacements uh, in that same 10 year period. Uh, so the number of patients who are needing these is growing. And so we wanna make sure that we can do the best that we can for them. Patients are a new generation of patients. They're uh, both younger and older. Uh, we're getting patients in their 40s that need to have their arthritis treated and patients in their 90s that need to have their arthritis treated. Uh, on occasion, we actually end up with uh, even some, uh, you know, even younger than that, which is very rare and we try to avoid. Patients in general want to maintain their quality of life and their active lifestyles. Uh, we live in this area because we like it. Uh, there's a lot to do outside. It's a, it's a beautiful area to get out and enjoy. Um, and so we want patients to get back to doing that. Patients are better informed today. Uh, they're coming to lectures uh, like this. Um, they're going on and getting information from their friends, uh, talking to their doctors, um, going online. Uh, the internet does allow access to more information, uh, such as you're getting tonight, uh, but beware of the internet. Um, there's no quality control. Uh, people can put up uh, anything that they want on there, um, and there's no check or, or truth that needs to be in there. Um, and beware of stem cells, uh, which we'll talk about um, in more depth momentarily. Especially important now, um, as we're not allowed to do joint replacements, is how can you avoid or delay a joint replacement? Um, there are multiple non-operative treatments for hip and knee pain. Um, and this is what we always try, regardless of if there was a pandemic or not. We try to help you avoid having your joint replaced until it's the right or appropriate time. Um, often just rest, ice, or heat can help some mild uh, arthritis pain and discomfort. Uh, some medications for uh, inflammation and pain, just over-the-counter medications, can often be very effective. Lifestyle modification can be important. So we want you to be active, but we want you to be joint-healthy active. Uh, physical therapy can be helpful to help with uh, range of motion and strengthening of the joint. Um, and now a lot of physical therapy uh, places are actually doing telehealth visits, uh, similar to what we're doing at the office, where they can help you uh, over the Internet with uh, secure uh, communication Joint fluid supplements or injections uh, can be very helpful. Knee arthroscopy or hip arthroscopy uh, can be very useful in certain indications, um, but it's not very good for arthritis. So if you have a discrete meniscus tear, an acute ACL tear, uh, without much arthritis, a knee arthroscopy may be helpful for that. Um, if you have a labral tear of the hip uh, without much arthritis in the joint, uh, a hip arthroscopy may be able to help you with that. Um, but if there's much arthritis in either of those cases, usually arthroscopic treatment isn't very effective. And then total joint replacement we'll talk about more extensively. These are some guidelines from the uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Uh, these are our, our clinical practice guidelines for non-surgical management of knee arthritis. Um, one of the most important things that you can see off the top there is weight loss. Um, it's recommended that patients who have a BMI of greater than 25 to, to work for weight loss. I uh, we want you to try to lose about 5% of your body weight in that case. Um, and we'll talk specifically about what a body mass index of 40 uh, means as well as far as surgery and risks moving forward. Um, exercise and physical therapy is good, so trying to get out. Um, some water therapy can be helpful, manual therapy. Um, trying to do joint healthy activities uh, can be very helpful uh, for helping offset and delay the need for surgery. Uh, oral medications, um, oral anti-inflammatories, 
uh, ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, Tylenol uh, can be very helpful as over-the-counter adjuncts to, to help treat some of the pain. Some topical capsation uh, gels may be helpful. Um, other medications such as tramadol, uh, Celebrex, other prescription medications may help to delay the need for surgery. Um, but we don't really recommend opioids or pain patches uh, for knee replacement or for patients with hip or knee arthritis. Um, opioids just tend to make you forget that you're having the pain. They don't do anything to treat the source of the pain. Um, and it can actually cause significant problems after surgery if you build up a tolerance to the opioids before surgery. So uh, we almost uh, never uh, prescribe opioids uh, in patients that have not had surgery uh, or a broken bone. Intraarticular injections, um, we'll talk more specifically about this. Uh, they can be helpful for uh, decreasing pain on a short period of time. Uh, there's some data um, that suggests that intraarticular cortisone injections can be helpful. Um, some growth factors are platelet-rich plasma. There's some inconclusive evidence on that. Um, they actually recommend not using hyaluronic acid or uh, the gel injections, uh, although in this time uh, they do give us an option to do something uh, to help patients to alleviate pain uh, when we're unable to perform surgery at this time. So the basics, the rice, the rest, the ice, the compression, the elevation, this is stuff you can all do at home, uh, all do now without having to come in and see us. Um, if you have questions, we are doing telehealth visits uh, through the clinic. Uh, it is a very straightforward process to get it set up for that. All you need is a smartphone or a uh, laptop or anything that has a camera uh, that we can see and turn on. It's just a click from an email um, and we can get you set up for one of those visits uh, and, and help to I, give you some advice on how to deal with some of this pain in this time. Uh, Over-the-counter medications, like I said, very helpful. Ibuprofen, Aleve, Tylenol. Um, those you want to take by the directions on the bottle. Um, you want to take the least amount that is helpful uh, for the least amount of time. So I often will tell patients to start with, you know, two ibuprofen in the morning, one Aleve in the, the morning and night, um, some Tylenol uh, throughout, but try not to overdose or take too much. Um, you don't want to take both ibuprofen and Aleve, um, but you can add Tylenol to either ibuprofen or Aleve, as long as you're not on blood thinners or have any liver or kidney dysfunction. Celebrex is a medication that you can take if you're on blood thinners. So often patients are on blood thinners and so they can't take ibuprofen or Aleve because they uh, impact bleeding. Uh, Celebrex, if it's okay with your uh, cardiologist or primary care doctor, may help for short term uh, pain relief in those situations where you have uh, to take blood thinners for your heart. Some topical compounds that are topical anti-inflammatories uh, or capsaicin like we talked about. Um, this is an alternative for patients who can't take oral medications. Um, it offers some relief uh, from the pain there uh, in the joints. And then glucosamine and chondroitin, a very popular supplements. Um, there are large studies, but there hasn't been any significant uh, large-scale uh, randomized control trials showing that they offer much benefit. But I tell patients if it's working for you, great. If you're not sure, go ahead and stop it for a period of time uh, and then see if it's helpful or not um, based on not using it. Specific uh, activity modification and weight loss. Um, you know, avoid those high impact activities. We want you to be active, we want you to be outside, but we want you to do it in a joint healthy way. So walking instead of running, biking instead of running, um, try to avoid jumping in high impact. Uh, sort of you know, lower impact Zumba type activities are, are very good. Um, in general, we want our weight loss goal to be a BMI below 40. So um, body mass index is a calculation that we come up with taking a patient's height um, and weight and running it through a calculation. And 40 has been deemed to be morbidly obese. Uh, and so it means your greatest risk to your overall general health is just your weight. Um, it's also, as we look at studies, a sort of a cutoff for patients that have increased risk of bleeding and infection, uh, blood clots, uh, pneumonias, uh, things after surgery. So it increases your complication rate after the surgery. Uh, and so it helps us to do that surgery in a much more safe manner uh, for you to actually be able to enjoy that joint after surgery. If those don't work, those are our first line uh, treatments. Uh, then we look into joint injections. Uh, there's four main types. So the, the cortisone or steroid injections, visco supplementation or hyaluronic acid injections, the platelet-rich plasma or PRP, uh, and then the stem cells. So we'll talk about each of these in general. Uh, for the cortisone, 
Um, they, it is a short-term uh, solution to the problem. It is not going to cure or fix any of the issues that are going on, but they are helpful for pain relief. Um, and especially in this time where um, we're trying to delay surgeries, it can be a short-term uh, treatment for this. Often patients will get three to four months of relief uh, from that joint pain. Uh, if not, you know, then we understand that the surgery is more imminent. There is some concern that too much cortisone uh, can damage ligaments and soft tissues, so we try to use this judiciously. So we like to spread it out by at least four months uh, for these injections. Uh, you can't get these every month or it will cause some, some damage. Um, and understand that we're not putting these in normal joints. So uh, we're not going to give you a cortisone injection if you don't already have arthritis or already have degradation of the joint. Um, so it's less of a concern if this joint continues to degrade, which is most likely going to happen anyway, um, because the alternative is uh, joint replacement or surgery. Uh, the visco supplementation, the chicken shots, this is hyaluronic acid. This is in uh, synthetic injections that are uh, either made in the lab or actually taken from the uh, comb of the rooster. Um, they're purified. Uh, hyaluronic acid is the normal fluid that is in your knee joint. And so this is sort of like Jiffy Lube for the knees. Um, we do these in a series of injections, um, and there are some single shot uh, injections that we can do as well. It is covered by most insurances in the knees, but not the hips. Uh, the idea is to kind of recoat that joint, um, lubricate that up, and, and decrease some of that pain and discomfort in the, the knee joint. It is off-label for hips, but there are some uh, patients that get these injected into the hips as well. Uh, there's no studies um, suggesting and supporting that, uh, but again, it is something that we can do uh, potentially in this time uh, to help alleviate some pain in hips and knees uh, when we're unable to, to do surgery at this particular time. PRP or platelet-rich plasma, this is injections of concentrated blood products uh, to enhance healing. It is not covered by insurance and can be expensive in the five to $600 range. The idea here is we draw some blood out, uh, spin it down and concentrate the, the products and then inject that into the joint uh, to stimulate a, a response and, and help some healing. Uh, there is actually some data supporting this in soft tissues, um, in uh, tennis elbow and hamstring injuries, uh, some rotator cuff. Um, there's not a lot of data supporting it in uh, joints, um, but there are some anecdotal studies and, and smaller studies showing some benefits similar to the level of cortisone. Um, Again, it is not covered by insurance and can be expensive, but it is an alternative uh, in this time that we may consider uh, for delaying joint replacements or, or offering something for some pain relief. Stem cells. Uh, stem cells were a very big thing in this area. Uh, the uh, big center for stem cells that's been spread out is uh, Regenex down in Broomfield. Um, the idea here is that we, uh, they obtain stem cells, uh, concentrate them, uh, inject them into the joint to decrease inflammation and promote healing. Uh, it's not covered by insurance and can be very expensive in the five to ten thousand dollar range or twenty thousand dollars if you go to the uh, Cayman Islands. Um, I think that this is there's some promise to stem cells and since it is a big topic, I figured it de deserved a little bit more time to look into the results and they seem to think that my future, um, even before the pandemic, uh, was to be shuffled to the uh, dustbin of history that orthopedic surgeons were. Uh, going to become obsolete because of the promise of stem cells. So for my own uh, job edification and, and to look into this, I figured it warranted that. Um, I did uh, work at Radio Shack and they went out of business. Um, so there are a lot of things that, that can change as you move forward. Um, so I want to look at their results from their hip and knee injections as how they compare those to surgeries. Again, they're comparing them to surgeries that are done in the mid-2000s, uh, around 2005, 2007. Uh, and a lot of things have changed and improved in the last 10 to 15 years in surgical techniques. Uh, but I wanted to show what the studies they have on their own website. This is a study where they're comparing total knee replacement, TKA, against bone marrow aspirate concentrate. That is the BMAC that you see there, uh, also known as stem cells. This is a comparing knee society assessment scores. So uh, this is out of 100. 100 is a perfect knee. Um, Preoperatively, the patients who had their knees replaced had a significant morbidity um, and complications at 48 out of 100. Um, and those patients improved to 80 out of 100 after their surgery. Uh, the stem cell patients uh, started out at a knee society score of 69 um, and did improve uh, to 82. Uh, afterwards, so they improved 13 points uh, compared to the 32 points uh, for a knee replacement patient. In comparing the, the patients that were involved uh, in the hip study, um, they had 
uh, patients who had preoperative, this Harris HIP score is also out of 100. So uh, for hips that started at 56, again, significant dysfunction in the hip and the performance of the hip joint before surgery. And after a hip replacement, it went to 94 out of 100. So fairly significant improvement, uh, quite dramatic. Uh, for the stem cell group, again, around 69 uh, for the hip score um, prior to the stem cell injection. After they did the bone marrow aspirate concentrator stem cells, again, it improved about 13 points up to uh, an 82 or 83. So um, that is not very impressive, um, the results of stem cells compared to surgery. Um, and at their cost and expense, um, it sounds like there's a lot more marketing and promise involved in this. Um, I do compare it to snake oil uh, because snake oil did actually work. Uh, it had nothing to do with the snakes. Uh, there was capsation powder uh, in some of the snake oil, um, and so the capsation was actually what was helping uh, with some of the pain of, that people were relieving with the snake oil. Uh, but you know, there, there may be some benefit, there may be something worth looking into in stem cells, um, but for right now it's still more promise um, than performance. Uh, and so I think if I was going to, to hedge my bets, um, that it will not be orthopedic surgery going to the dustbin of history, um, that stem cells in joints um, will may, maybe head that way, similar to snake oil. Um, there are consequences to delaying surgery. Um, I understand we're at a time uh, right now where we are not doing elective surgeries for the greater good, um, and surgery is a difficult decision. So uh, they actually did a study at Duke uh, in North Carolina, a uh, big tertiary, uh, tertiary referral center, um, and 88% of the patients that they offered joint replacement to declined to have the surgery at that time. Um, arthritis, unfortunately, is a degenerative disease. It is not going to get better on its own. Uh, it is going to continue to get worse. You may have good days, um, but in general, overall, it is kind of a downward slope. Uh, there are better outcomes reported in patients who had their uh, total joint operation earlier in the disease process. So patients who had surgery at the time they were told versus patients who waited two years uh, to have surgery. Uh, the patients who had surgery earlier uh, had improved function and reduced pain. This is not to taunt uh, patients that we're forcing to delay their surgeries currently, uh, just to say that you don't want to wait as long as you possibly can anymore. That was a very common thing 10 to 20 years ago was to tell patients for uh, joint replacement surgery to wait as long as they possibly could and try to put up with it as much as they can. Um, we're realizing that we have better outcomes uh, and better materials uh, to make these patients do better uh, and recover faster, uh, as well as have uh, durable, long-lasting joints. There are new opportunities in arthroplasty or joint replacement, improvements in the hip and knee replacement materials, uh, the success rates of greater than 90% at 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, we're thinking that we have some very positive uh, results up to 30 years out from surgery. Uh, it doesn't have to be the whole joint. Uh, there are partial versus total knee replacements. It's new minimally invasive uh, designs, minimally invasive techniques for the surgery. One of those uh, is makoplasty uh, or uh, the Mako robot uh, from Stryker Surgical. Uh, it is a robotic arm-assisted computer navigated uh, assistant in the surgery. It allows us to perform uh, the surgery in a reproducible and consistent manner. Uh, and it is available for uh, partial knee, total knee, and total hip. The idea for this started uh, in 2006 um, with the idea that a manually done uh, traditional partial knee replacement was a very difficult and technically demanding procedure. As you can see, arthritis can be isolated to just one compartment of the joint, and so if you can preserve the rest of the knee, uh, it can be very helpful and beneficial to the patients. Unfortunately, it is a very difficult procedure with manual instruments. So by using this Mako robot, uh, robotic arm, to perform it allows it to be consistent, reproducible, um, and improve the outcomes for patients. So if this damage is isolated to just one part of the knee, we can go in and just replace that inside part of the knee. This maintains the ACL and PCL intact. It leaves the remaining two-thirds to three-quarters of a knee, so it feels more like a normal knee. It's less of a recovery of surgery uh, and a little quicker to bounce back from. Then arthritis can also be isolated to just under the kneecap uh, or under the uh, patellofemoral joint that we call it. Uh, so we can actually put a little plastic button on the undersurface of your kneecap and just replace under the kneecap. In some patients, younger patients, there can be arthritis that's just isolated to those two combined. Uh, and so if we want to preserve their ACL and PCL and do bone conservation, uh, we can just replace the inside and under the kneecap and not jump straight to a total knee uh, to preserve some of that bony structure that's available. 
So this macoplasty procedure, uh, the patient must have the correct indications for the procedure. You need to have arthritis in the correct area. It needs to hurt in the right spot. Um, and the x-rays uh, need to match up. Uh, we then get a CT scan that's performed to make a 3D model of the knee. So we run you through, they actually trace each individual CT scan slice and recreate this pink model that you see on the right side, which is your bones uh, that we plan off of. Once we have that model made, um, we scan those components in. Uh, so we have the size, the position. Uh, we can position those components to a tenth of a degree or a tenth of a millimeter virtually uh, and see exactly where those parts need to fit, what size needs to be there. We can take off the shelf components and fit them exactly where they need to fit. There are eight different sizes, um, so it allows it to be very consistent. We then get you back into surgery. Uh, we place pins into the uh, thigh bone and shin bone uh, with tracking devices so that we can actually follow the, the bones in real time in space. Um, we find the center of the hip so we can isolate from the center of the hip to the center of the knee to the center of the ankle. This allows us to line that joint up. So if you start out a little bow-legged, we want to straighten that out. If you start out a little knock-kneed, we again want to straighten that out. So the idea is to correct that deformity um, and actually see that in real time. We map out the bones in space, so we actually go through and mark exactly on the patient's own bone, um, and then that information is combined with the CT scan, so we can create a model and then actually track that in real time. We're able to confirm that it is that patient's CT scan, that patient's knee, um, which gives us a level of safety uh, as we move forward. Once that CT scan is combined with the patient's real uh, anatomy, we can actually take the knee through a range of motion uh, and get information and we can make adjustments during the surgery before we've committed to any position for the implants uh, or the, the patient's soft tissue. We can optimize the implant tracking. Uh, we can actually map the residual remaining cartilage so there's a nice smooth transition from cartilage to implant. Um, we can adjust and move these at complete. The best thing that we can do with this is to joint balance before we make our bone cuts. So we can actually make sure the patient's gonna have a nice functioning, well-balanced knee uh, before we commit to making any saw cuts. It's an infinitely personalized process where we can move that component anywhere we want virtually um, and actually then execute that plan specific for that particular patient. It's done through a minimal incision for less soft tissue damage. Uh, we have a little burr that goes in there and, and removes that bone. Um, the burr enters into this safety zone. So um, you can kind of see some yellow cross hatching on the bottom right of the, the picture up there. Um, that blue burr enters in there um, and it won't turn on unless it's inside that zone. Um, and once it's inside there, it won't go outside. So it sort of keeps us inside the lines, allows us to take just enough bone uh, for the implant to replace it and it won't let us go outside those planned resection guides. So when I say that it's safer for particular patients, it's safer for the soft tissue so that we're not gonna cut something that we don't intend to um, and we don't have any oopses or accidents at the time of the surgery. It allows it to be very consistent, very reproducible um, in the goal of giving patients uh, excellent outcomes. This is what it looks like when we have that bone burred out um, and then we cement that uh, nice shiny component in place getting rid of that hard arthritic bone and replacing the bearing surface with metal and plastic. So what it looks like on x-ray, you can see on the right hand, left hand side of the screen, uh, bone on bone on the inside, uh, and then on the right hand side, we've had that space in there. That space is a piece of plastic uh, that the metal part is uh, bearing on there. So just removing that inside portion. It's a less invasive, more accurate, uh, reproducible, uh, and bone conserving procedure um, that allows us to to give patients a little quicker recovery, a little less pain after the surgery, and a more normal feeling knee because we're able to leave more of the normal knee intact. Uh, there may be some downside to leaving the normal knee intact. You can still have injuries after this. Um, there can still be issues that, that can occur. Um, there is the chance that the rest of the knee could possibly wear out, um, but those are all very low. When this is done and we're doing uh, better uh, technique on the surgical side, we've decreased the revision rate by 75% and increase patient satisfaction uh, significantly. So if we can do this for the partial knee, um, we needed to be able to do it for the total knee. So the partial knee started in 2006. The total knee uh, it started uh, about three and a half years ago at the end of 2016. Uh, we were actually one of the first sites to, to combine 
the Mako robotic arm assisted technology with the total knee replacement uh, in the country. Um, this is what a total knee replacement looks like. Um, we're resurfacing the end of the thigh bone or the femur with metal. Um, we're resurfacing the, the proximal end of the tibia or shin bone uh, with metal. There is a plastic liner uh, that is in between. Um, and then the patella is resurfaced uh, with a button of plastic uh, to make sure that's not an issue uh, down the road as well. This again is what a normal knee looks like. Nice, smooth arth uh, articular cartilage, uh, no pain fibers. When that starts to wear down or expose that bone underneath, causing pain and discomfort, the patient's failed over-the-counter medications, injections, um, and the decision is made to, to replace that knee joint. This is what that looks like. So we work within the confines of the medial and lateral ligaments, those stay intact, and then replace the bearing surface of bone on bone uh, with metal and plastic uh, to help alleviate that joint pain. So this is what it looks like on x-ray. Again, a normal knee joint on the left-hand side, good space between the, the bones. And then on the right-hand side, bone on bone, significant arthritis and wear and tear throughout the joint. And so we replace the ends of the bone with metal and plastic uh, to give a nice, smooth bearing surface and get rid of that pain and discomfort. There is some variability uh, with manual instrumentation. So uh, this is the way that they started doing this in the beginning when they started replacing uh, total knees in the 70s, um, the, which was the best that they could, could do at the time. Um, it is still an excellent uh, procedure, uh, manual or uh, robotic arm assisted, uh, but we do think that the robot helps us to reduce some of the variability of manual instrumentation. Um, part of the reason that we're doing this is for patient satisfaction. So um, the move from manual instrumentation to robotic arm-assisted uh, joint replacement, uh, in general, 80-plus percent of patients are uh, satisfied with their knee replacement, um, but our survivorship or durability is up to 99% at 10 years. Uh, so that leaves us with a gap of 18% of patients that have a knee that they aren't happy with. So uh, we call that patient, it looks good but feels bad. So the idea is to try to figure out why that happens and why that occurs and try to make all patients satisfied uh, with their joint replacement. And my belief is that robotic arm-assisted surgery allows us to do that. The goal here is similar uh, to the partial knee. So we get a CT scan of the knee before surgery. Uh, we make a 3D model of the knee. And then we can size and position our parts um, before we're even in the operating room. So we have preoperative plans that are accurate and precise. Uh, we can know what size of implants we're going to be using. Um, and we have the, the initial rough position that they need to be in. Um, these are the arrays that we place in the thigh bone and shin bone to track those bones in space. We go through that bony registration process and confirmation of that to match up your knee to your CT scan. Um, and then this is the real genius part of the procedure is the interoperative feedback and ligament balancing allowing us to make intraoperative adjustments to those uh, component positions and then actually execute that surgery and that plan precisely and accurately uh, with that robotic arm assisted bone resection. So this is what the, the planning page looks like. So they make this white 3D model uh, after scanning through that CT scan and tracing all those slides. Um, and then we can size and position our components to where they need to fit. So we can make sure that it's not gonna be the wrong size. It's not gonna be too big. It's not gonna be too small. Again, they have eight sizes uh, for fitting on here. Um, I have not run across a patient that did not fit into one of those eight sizes. Um, and so it, it allows us to figure out where those off-the-shelf components seem to fit that are, have proven durability of 99% to 10 years uh, and figure out how we can fit them best in that particular patient. So it takes a off-the-shelf component but personalize it for each individual patient. We then do what we call dynamic pre-resection balancing so we can actually take the knee through a range of motion. Our goal is to get balanced flexion and extension gaps. So we can see the numbers of these gaps at 18 that show up there. Um, the components themselves add up to 18 millimeters, so we want to make sure that they have room to fit inside the knee joint um, without being too tight or too loose. And so we can see that in both extension um, and balance that inflection. So if you have balance, flexion, and extension gaps, you'll have a well-functioning, well-balanced, stable knee throughout the range of motion, uh, which should give you a better performing knee, which allows you to be more satisfied with the outcomes at the end of surgery. So this is where we really didn't have this information beforehand, or really we're sort of trying to guess what these gaps are. We're trying to chase our tails and do um, joint balancing with uh, soft tissue releases, or, or trying to force um, the knee to accept the 
instrumentation that we had available to us, and now we can get in feedback from the patient's actual knee at the time of the surgery before we've done any of these bone cuts and adjust the position of those the components uh, in order to try to optimize the patient's outcome uh, from the surgery. Once we have those parts virtually where we want them to be, uh, we then bring in the robotic arm. Again, these yellow lines are safety zones, so that will keep us from cutting things that we don't want to cut. Um, so I've actually done studies showing that the cuts are more accurate um, and more gentle on the soft tissues than manual uh, instrument cutting. Um, so I think it's safer overall for the patients as well. And it actually protects the area that we don't want to cut for the, the back of the PCL or the, the artery behind the leg uh, that's back there. So uh, a very significant level of safety with these cuts and this robotic arm assistance in addition to accuracy. So how does it actually functionally work? Uh, so I did a study in Europe uh, comparing robotic arm assisted total knees with manually uh, done total knee replacements, more conventional jig based. Uh, it's a small study, 30 patients in each arm. Uh, but it's a very important study as you look for initial uh, results from the surgery. Um, so it took the patients a little bit longer at the time of surgery to have their surgery performed, um, but they had less blood loss at the time of surgery. Uh, they had less pain after surgery, a fairly significant amount. So on a pain scale of 0 to 10, it was a 3 uh, compared to a 5 on the first day and a 3.6 compared to a 6 on the second day. So pretty significant decrease in uh, pain scores. They also had less narcotic usage in the robotic arm-assisted patients. Uh, less physical therapy was needed for the robotic arm-assisted patients. Um, in general, patients seemed happier uh, with their higher uh, satisfaction scores with the robotic arm-assisted patients as compared to the more conventional patients. So uh, combining this technology with soft tissue uh, friendly procedures uh, as minimally invasive total knee. So the reason that uh, my fellowship was called the Kuhn Joint Replacement uh, Institute was from Thomas Kuhn, uh, who was one of the inventors of minimally invasive knee replacement uh, 15 to 20 years ago. Um, his whole idea was to, to figure out a way to do the surgery uh, with less soft tissue damage. Um, so our goal uh, is to provide early and exceptional analgesia, so give you pain relief uh, to allow you to recover from the surgery perform that low trauma surgery, and then have a more rapid discharge and rapid rehabilitation. So uh, 20 years ago, patients stayed in the hospital for seven to 10 days after a joint replacement, um, and now we're sending patients home the same day uh, or after one night in the hospital. One of the initial goals is to prevent the bad effects from surgery. So we want to uh, stop the pain before it starts. So we do the Celebrex and a spinal anesthetic. That allows you to wake up a little bit more uh, control. Uh, you're not waking up in a significant amount of pain from the surgery. Um, preemptive anti-nausea medicine, so some Pepsid to kind of calm your stomach. Um, we do an injection around the joint um, and some IV sedation, so you don't have to be awake for the surgery. Uh, try to get patients up and walking the same day, um, working on range of motion the same day with physical therapy. Uh, patients can go home the same day uh, with surgery. We try to have you do stairs before you need to go home, uh, so this can be done you know, the day of surgery or the next day. Um, and so we want this done you know, as safe as we can. So not everyone is going to be a candidate for outpatient surgery. There are going to be patients who need to stay overnight, uh, but more and more people are feeling comfortable with, with going home the same day. We've now moved uh, to hips and what that looks like for hip replacement or hip arthroplasty. Bearing surfaces are very important uh, in the hip joint, so that ball and cup. Um, I use on almost everybody a ceramic ball with a plastic liner. There are also ceramic on ceramic bearings so that the liner and the ball are both ceramic. There's metal on plastic, which is the second most popular, the metal ball uh, and a plastic liner, and then metal on metal. Uh, metal on metal was very popular um, five to 10 years ago. Uh, it was sort of making a recurrence. You could have a larger ball, which gave you more stability in the hip joint. Um, but there were some complications or problems with that. Uh, most recently on Grey's Anatomy, uh, the, where I was actually uh, ads for this talk that you're listening to now, um, one of the uh, characters uh, had undergone a hip replacement um, and uh, got cobalt poisoning uh, from his hip replacement and started to show signs of dementia. So um, metal on metal complications are rare, but they are significant and serious. So um, knowing that this is going to come up for my patients that hear about this from Grey's Anatomy, I thought I would address it uh, more immediately, um, that we do not use uh, metal on metal in our hips uh, for actually this very reason, uh, to not have to worry about complications from metal on metal uh, hip replacements. Um, I also uh, do hip replacements from the anterior approach, or the direct anterior. Um, I think this is a minimally invasive uh, approach for the hip replacement. 
what does that mean or what is that? So um, it allows us to uh, good access to the joint without having to disrupt or cut any muscles or tendons. We're actually able to spread between muscles to get down to the hip joint. Uh, the incision's up by the front pocket uh, rather than on the side or the back. And so it gives us good uh, access to the hip joint without having to disrupt any of the soft tissue. Traditional hip replacement uh, can be a larger incision on the side. They do have shorter incisions for uh, lateral hip replacements as well. Um, you know, a five, four or five inch incision for an anterior approach hip, uh, it is more toward the uh, pocket, like your front pocket, rather than sort of in the groin area. So it's, it's still slightly lateral. Um, but no muscles or tendons are disrupted as we go in there. Uh, with a posterior approach, no matter how you do it, if you don't go from a direct anterior, you do have to cut through some muscles or tissues, whether you call it the posterior lateral, direct lateral, or direct superior, you do have to cut through muscles and tissues uh, to get down to that joint um, where you don't have to do that from an anterior approach. Why I do it from the anterior approach? Um, the hip is actually closer to the front of the body. Um, it, this technique and approach is a surgical dissection, so it's intranervous plane, it's an intramuscular plane. Um, it allows us to push those muscles out of the way. Um, we don't have to detach any of those muscles. Um, there's truly minimal risk to nerves. There is a femoral nerve that, that is in the vicinity and we know where that is, um, but we avoid it. There's a uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve which supplies some skin uh, to the thigh. Uh, again, we know where that is and we avoid it. Um, so there's minimal risk to the nerves and so it allows it to be a minimally invasive uh, surgical approach. This is a picture of a posterior approach where you're having to cut through this large tensor fascia lata in order to gain access to the hip joint. Um, when we go from the front, we do find that there seems to be less pain and a quicker restoration of function. Um, seems to be a shorter hospital stay um, and probably more economical. Um, although patients who have a posterior approach surgery done with an experienced uh, surgeon, uh, such as Dr. Rector, one of my partners, uh, do very well as well. Why do I do it this way? Um, it's a, an ideal soft tissue interval. Um, we do strap you into this contraption. This is called an arch table, and it just allows us to position your leg in space reproducibly, um, which is very simple and eases our patient positioning. Um, you're lying flat on your back. Um, it's easier for anesthesia from this aspect. Um, and then it's simple socket, socket instrumentation uh, so we can get that cup in consistently. Why doesn't everybody do it this way? Um, it's unfamiliar territory. Um, exposing that thigh bone or the femur uh, can be somewhat difficult. Um, and it does require a little bit of specialized equipment to get access to the joint uh, and to see what you're doing and understand what's going on there. The learning curve seems to be about 50 cases um, in the literature. Um, and so after having thousands of these, uh, this is just the way I'm much more comfortable doing a hip replacement from the front as opposed to the back. How it's done, um, so I kind of want to show you what some of these special instruments and retractors look like. Um, we usually use the ones on the right instead of the left, especially with our new social distancing uh, requirements. We do have a light that we use uh, on our head to be able to see into the hole that we make uh, by spreading those muscles. And then this is that arch table in action. You can see it just kind of positions the leg in space. It's an assistant that doesn't ask to go to the bathroom, uh, doesn't ask for a raise, and doesn't need a, a lunch break. Video here, so the, the head on the right hand side of the screen, the foot on the left, this is the access to the hip joint and spreading down between there. Um, these are the nerves I talked about where we identify and know where they are and just avoid them. Um, the tensor fascia lata that we pull back, so we spread down between there. There is one vessel that we coagulate um, and keep control of on our way in, um, so there seems to be less bleeding with this uh, approach. We expose that hip joint, um, place our retractors um, in order to, on the, the neck of the femoral bone, um, and then gain access into that joint. So we go into the capsule and, and remove portions of that and access the, the actual joint underneath. So I find the capsule to be very thickened and pathologic, and so I often remove that at the time of surgery. And now you see we have excellent uh, exposure of the hip joint, and we can see uh, where we need to proceed from there. Uh, we then go in and actually uh, disarticulate the hip, so we uh, remove the, the bell from the socket. Um, I told you I had learned how to do this in Napa Valley, so we had wine corks uh, and wine removal uh, tools around, um, and that allowed us to uh, remove the femoral head uh, with ease. So we remove that um, ball portion from there um, and then turn our attention toward the, the acetabulum or the cup side. 
Um, we want to place our retractors uh, in safe position um, and we can get excellent exposure of that hip joint. Um, we then go in with a, a little cheese grater type device and freshen up the bone uh, to make sure that it's bleeding uh, so that we can put our metal cup in uh, and the bone can grow onto that. We put in the plastic liner that is our bearing surface. Um, we've had great success with these liners uh, and think that we're going to have 20 to 30 years uh, of life uh, from these hip replacements. This is the more difficult portion of the procedure, so uh, exposing the, the femoral side uh, or the thigh bone um, takes a little bit of time and, and learning to do that. Uh, you need to put your retractors in the appropriate area um, and expose the, the capsule underneath, and then that capsule needs to be removed uh, from the edge uh, to allow you to mobilize the proximal part of the thigh bone uh, in order to put in your stem for the procedure. So. Um, we then machine uh, the thigh bone uh, with brooches uh, to find the right size. Um, and once we have that nice stable uh, stem in place, uh, we can trial uh, necks and heads to, to give us the stability that we want from our patients. So we're sort of rebuilding uh, the hip that we just uh, took out. So then we can remove our retractors, and then we need to put that ball back into the cup. So there are people that use this uh, hook uh, procedure that you see there. I actually don't use that uh, for the portion of the procedure, um, so it's a little less um, exciting than it appears in this, this video. Um, we then use that arch table to position the leg back in. Those muscles that you see attaching uh, to the bone there, that's what's not cut in an anterior approach that is cut in a posterior approach. Um, and then we maneuver that leg back in and reduce that ball back into the cup uh, for a nice stable hip joint. So now that you've all seen how to do this at home, uh, you can take care of your hip replacement problems and pain uh, on your own. Um, one of the other benefits for uh, direct anterior hip replacement um, is fewer restrictions after the surgery. Um, so the main thing that we don't want patients to do is turn their foot all the way out to the side and bring it back behind them. Um, when patients have traditional hip replacements, they don't want them to, to flex their knee up uh, at their hip more than 90. They don't want you to cross your legs. You often have to sleep with a pillow between your legs. Uh, we don't have any of those restrictions of traditional hip replacements after an anterior approach hip replacement. Um, so in general, uh, the benefits that I see with the anterior approach um, are a decreased hospital stay and quicker rehabilitation. Um, we actually have patients uh, just do exercises on their own for three to six weeks and then decide if they need formal physical therapy after that. Um, we will often send uh, about half the patients to actual formal physical therapy. Um, it is a little bit smaller incision, but the big thing is reduced muscle disruption, so it's a little shorter recovery time and less scarring. Um, potential for less blood loss. Um, it's actually a very quick uh, surgery um, and reduced post-operative pain. Most patients just take Tylenol after the surgery, although we do give patients a short prescription of uh, opioids. Um, and if you need a refill, we have you come in uh, so we can make sure nothing strange has happened. The risk of dislocation is reduced. So this is one of the big things um, that's a complication that we want to, to avoid um, from our own uh, surgical techniques. Um, and it's more stable by not cutting through those muscles. It's not zero, uh, but it's much reduced compared to a posterior approach. Um, and because we're not damaging those muscles, it may allow for a more natural return to function and activity. So I think this is a minimally invasive surgical approach that's better for patients. There's almost no hip precautions, um, and it gives us improved control over the component position and placement. Um, and that's the soft tissue aspect. And then we want to combine that with the technology we talked about earlier uh, in the hip replacement with the robotic arm assistance. So why do we want to add this in? It gives us a, an increased level of precision um, and execution of the surgery, uh, confidence in our component position. Um, we do get fluoroscopic images at, during the surgery, but the recovery uh, room x-ray is a little bit too late to go back and change something. Um, and so this allows us to optimize our surgical results, uh, mainly focused on the cup side. So um, when we're doing robotic arm assisted total hips, it gives us a better plan. We do get that same uh, CT scan with a 3D model. So instead of doing two dimensional planning like you see on the left hand side of the screen, which is more traditional, sort of put up an x-ray and try to measure, um, we use uh, uh, digital templating, uh, which is the same idea, two dimensional uh, planning. Uh, we actually get three dimensional information from the CT scan um, and have better uh, three dimensional CT scan assisted planning. Um, so we can figure out where the cup needs to be, the position and angle for the cup, um, that's important um, because we've actually found out we're not very good at 
um, as we think we are and putting that cup in a consistent area. So on the left hand side of the screen you can see um, a box plot and then there's sort of a lot of scattered uh, buckshot around there. Um, inside that box is our target zone. Um, this was a study that was done at Massachusetts General Hospital um, and they found that it was about 50-50 uh, that surgeons were able to put the cup inside that box um, which is referred to as our safe zone. Um, compare that um, to 100 patients uh, on the right hand side of the screen where 96% uh, were in the target zone um, and 95% were within four degrees of the, the plan, surgical uh, plan. Uh, so much more accurate and consistent, reproducible with the robotic arm assistance uh, for the surgery. This was uh, confirmed um, by a single surgeon in Chicago, actually, uh, who's the mentor of my partner, Dr. Chen. Um, compared robotic arm assistance with more conventional um, x-ray guided uh, hips. Still did well uh, and better with his conventional hip replacements. I uh, was at 80% inside that safety box, um, but it was 100% with the robot. So um, the robotic arm assistance allows us more consistency and fewer outliers as we move through with the surgery. So our goals of surgery and hip replacement, knee replacement are always the same. We want pain relief, number one. Uh, we want patients to, uh, restoration of lifestyle and function, so we want you to be able to get back to going outside, uh, back to enjoying the uh, area that we live. Um, we want to optimize the patient outcomes. We want to do as, as good a job as we can. And from an economic standpoint, we want to do this with, uh, as, as um, inexpensively as we can. So um, if we can save money on the, the back end of things with less physical therapy, um, less need for secondary rehabilitation centers, skilled nursing facilities, um, that's where we think we can really make benefits and overall lower the cost of, of care uh, in this environment. So um, in general, similar uh, goals with our MIS total knees, with our direct anterior total hip as far as the surgery, um, early and exceptional analgesia, a low trauma surgery, um, and then early discharge and rapid rehabilitation. Again, the spinal anesthetic um, and Celebrex, an anti-inflammatory before the surgery, uh, Pepsid uh, to help prevent the, the nausea after the, or after the surgery. Um, we do still do that IV sedation so you don't have to be awake during these surgeries. Um, we do do injections around the capsule which help for pain. Um, again, get patients up, get them walking. Um, ideally, same day uh, ambulation, um, same day discharge um, if deemed safe by the patient and the physical therapist. Uh, this was the uh, first patient that I did uh, hip replacement on in Boulder. Um, He's kind of cheating in a definitely a bolder patient, uh, but he was 80 uh, years old. Um, and f uh, four months after the hip replacement, uh, he was cresting Teton Pass on his bike. Uh, and uh, five months, he was doing a century ride um, to Estes Park. So he told me he'd put 10,000 miles on his hip uh, in the 18 months that he had after his hip replacement. Um, he's just continued to pile up mileage uh, ever since. So, um, in summary, you know, I think the, the robotic arm assisted uh, surgery is more accurate than a, a manually done total hip. Um, there's a lower dislocation rate, um, less change in leg lengths, uh, less blood loss, um, and uh, excellent patient reported outcome measures. The potential downsides with robotic assisted hip replacement, it does take a slightly bit longer time in the operating room, uh, but there was no increased in infections. Um, and so the, the cost benefit analysis is still out there, but it looks promising as far as an economic standpoint. Um, in general, uh, as we talk about these uh, knee and hip replacement surgeries, there are risks with any kind of surgery. Um, these include bleeding, uh, infection, damage to nerves and vessels, uh, need for further surgery, blood clots, blood clots going to your lungs, um, and then rare things like stroke, heart attack, and death. Um, you know, not to sort of end the talk on a bad note, but um, this is sort of the end of the commercial stuff where you have to tell people that it's not all, all good. So um, there are rare bad things that can happen. We try to prevent that uh, if we can. Uh, current limitations in our environment. So this is not a part of the usual talk. Um, so our elective surgery is certainly on hold um, in, with the governor's order until the 26th of April. Uh, at that time, if he does not extend that, um, we will look to open uh, elective cases such as joint replacement as soon as we safely can. Um, that will likely be done at the surgery center, uh, Boulder Surgery Center, um, over by our office um, before we move to the uh, Boulder Community Health. Luckily, um, we've been very good um, and very 
minimally hit um, with this COVID-19 virus, um, so we have not overwhelmed the system. Um, what you're doing by staying home is working, so we thank you for that. Um, I have not had to run a ventilator, um, which everyone is thankful for. Um, our frontline staff has been doing great. Um, we uh, commend them um, and the administration of the hospital. Um, we definitely have uh, not overwhelmed the system. There's plenty of bed space left. And so as soon as it's deemed safe, um, we think we'll be able to proceed with that. Um, we're hoping by the end of the month or middle of next month, um, we can resume with these uh, elective surgeries. So um, thank you uh, for your time. Um, and I think we have some questions. Thank you very much. Um, I have a first question. I had my hip replacement surgery canceled due to the awful coronavirus. I feel like I'm at risk for further injury as it is awkward to move and slash and amp and it's painful. I walk a lot even though it's uncomfortable. Is it okay to walk? So if, you're, if your surgery has been canceled and you, you still are having a significant amount of pain, um, it may feel like things are a little bit unstable. Um, it is safe to walk. Um, it is safe to, to go out and do things. Um, you may need to have a, a cane uh, or a walker or some walking sticks with you um, to help for sort of stability or balance um, because you can sometimes get a sudden jolt of pain uh, that may feel like things are kind of giving out. Um, but, you know, you should be able to try to, to move as much as you can and tolerate, um, and hopefully we can get back and, and get that hip fixed soon. Why, um, why is an HA injection not rec recommended? Why is the HA injection not recommended? Um, so uh, at this time, um, as we look at the data and we're trying to see what's going on, um, there's not a lot of great data supporting HA injections as compared to saline injections. So saline is just normal saline, uh, basically salt water um, that's injected into the knee joint. They've actually done comparison studies uh, with those two and found that there wasn't a whole lot of difference. Um, Kaiser, for example, uh, the health system does not pay for HA injections anymore. Uh, some other insurance companies are not paying for HA injections based on some of the equivocal data that's out there. Um, there are some patients who swear by it and, and think that it definitely helps. Um, but as the arthritis becomes more severe or significant, there is less chance that it's going to be successful or helpful. Um, and so I think that's where some of the data comes in. In early arthritis, it may be more helpful because there's not as much damage to the joint. Uh, but in later, more significant arthritis, it doesn't seem to work as well. Are heat and slash cold patches effective? Are heat slash cold patches effective? Um, they can be. Um, you know, it's not quite as consistent because it is tough to get the hot or cold with the patches down into those areas um, because the joints are deeper, obviously, than the skin. Um, so it can be a little bit difficult to get down there. You can try it and see if it helps. I know some people do icing on their knees or in their hip area. It can be kind of difficult to ice the hip joint because it is deeper inside the body. Um, but knee, icing the knees seems to help. Sometimes some hot pads can kind of loosen things up a little bit. Um, in general, we tend to recommend ice over heat because the ice causes the blood to collect in that area, which is where the healing uh, products and anti-inflammatory stuff comes from. Um, but some people like the heat because it does tend, can loosen the joint up a little bit. Um, are, total, are total knee replacements quad sparing? Are total knee replacements quad sparing? So, um, interesting question. So, the quad sparing term actually comes from Dr. Tom Kuhn, who I learned how to do the surgery with. Um, even he says that's a bit of a misnomer. Um, we do have to kind of cut a little bit uh, just above the, the kneecap. So, we try to be as quad um, friendly as we can. Um, we actually call it a mini mid vastus approach. Um, so we have to cut a little bit of that quadriceps. It's much less than it used to be um, when they would cut sort of halfway up the thigh um, 15, 20 years ago and really turn everything inside out. Um, so it's not necessarily quad sparing, uh, but it does, um, it's as quad friendly as we can make it. Okay. Um, what is the expected life of a new hip? What is the expected life of a new hip? So that's a good question. So uh, we think the lifespan for both knees and hips is about 90% chance of 20 years. Uh, we think it's got a good chance of 30 years. So that's sort of our goals is to try to get these to last, you know, closer to 30 years. Great. Um, are total knee, replacements able to, uh, t total knee replacements able to keep skiing if they had done it, be uh, have, if they had done it before the surgery? Yep. So uh, after surgery for, for total knee and total hip replacement patients, um, can they go back to skiing? 
Um, if they're accomplished skiers and safe with it, I, I let patients go back to skiing. Um, I let patients go back, hike, bike, ski, swim, elliptical. Um, the main things that I try to have them avoid doing are running and jumping. Um, by the time most people meet me, they've given up running and jumping. I'm not overly popular in Boulder County for telling people they can't run or jump. Um, but the other thing I tell you is I'm not going to follow you around, so it's yours. I put it in there. I tell you the, the pros and cons or risks and recommendations, um, but you can do with it kind of as you wish. Great. Um, can you describe the position one in, on the special table for hip replacement? Um, does it ever create problems in other parts of the body? Uh, so with the special table that we use for the, the hip replacement, um, it does involve some twisting. So sometimes if patients have um, some knee arthritis or, or difficulty with the knee, sometimes we can aggravate some knee arthritis. Um, I would have thought it would aggravate some patients' back or underlying back issues. It seems to less do that, and actually more patients tell us that their back feels better after their hip replacement than before their hip replacement, um, but that sort of twisting and torquing can uh, irritate the back as well. Um, and then there are, before they figured out that you needed to cut the ball off first um, when we do the surgery, there was some um, tales of people breaking ankles when they were maneuvering around the table, uh, but that's incredibly rare at this point. Great. Um, can you match a hip replacement to one previously done? Can you match a hip replacement to one previously done? Um, so, I mean, we try to uh, match things up as far as leg lengths and, and offset and sort of performance. Um, we don't necessarily try to match up the x-rays to look exactly the same. Uh, sometimes the implants that were used uh, are different than the ones that I'm most comfortable with. Um, what you really want is the surgeon to use the implant that they're most comfortable with um, rather than try to use an implant that makes the x-ray look the same. Um, the ball and cup is very consistent design, um, and that's the big part is to get rid of that joint that's in there. Um, so I think that's better is to just find someone that you trust to do your surgery um, and trust that they're going to match up the performance of the hip to the other side. Sure. Um, do you have any treatment suggestions for bursitis? Do I have any treatment uh, per, uh, suggestions for bursitis? Yes. So um, if you have that bursitis or the pain that's more on the outside of the hip joint, uh, worse if you lay on that side or try to sleep on that side, um, some stretching can be good. So even if you just try to kind of bring your leg across um, and bring your knee up towards your shoulder and kind of work on stretching that area over there. Um, sometimes a foam roller, you want to stay off of the hip itself, so actually a little bit distal to that, um, and sort of stay above your knee and sort of just the lateral thigh to kind of roll and stretch that out. Um, and then anti-inflammatories, so ibuprofen or Aleve um, are very effective in knocking that out. If those things don't work, then we do have injections or other things that we can look at. Sure. Um, some, I, someone has had uh, success with gluten-free for their knee arthritis. Are there other things uh, that one should avoid? regarding inflammation? Um, there's a lot of uh, things out there, um, you know, as far as, you know, should a diet affect in, you know, your, your arthritis pain. Um, I always take the stories like that about the, you know, I went gluten-free and everything started feeling better. You don't know what the underlying disease is or what the underlying x-rays look like. Um, so there are some sort of general ideas of anti-inflammatory diets. It hasn't been really applied to scientific models or randomized controlled trials to sort of prove that to us on a scientific level, but there's definitely anecdotal data about that. Um, you know, there, there is a big push in Boulder County about being gluten-free and gluten intolerance, um, but I went to Target to try to buy flour for my kid's birthday party, um, and the only flour that was left was gluten-free flour, so I don't know if the virus cured the gluten intolerance of Boulder County um, or just the fear of it, but um, there isn't to, to get back to the point, I don't know of a specific diet that, that sort of helps with that. When can a patient return to work after a hip lip re replacement if work requires some bending and stepping onto stools and such? Um, so getting back to work, it is sort of job dependent. Um, I have had patients that were back doing telehealth or back doing sort of work on the computer stuff, you know, the next day. Um, you know, but patients who have to go or have, you know, sort of mildly... Uh, uh, demanding jobs or physically demanding. You know, I tell patients three weeks plus or minus, so if you're ready to go back to work before then, you often know your job better than I do, um, and so we're ready to have you go back if you feel comfortable. Um, the longest that we can give you uh, is three months off um, to support for the, the FMLA that's out there for the recovery time. 
it's incredibly rare that patients need that long. Um, but in general, we tell people three to four weeks, kind of depending on the job. But if you're ready to go back sooner, we're happy to let you go back. Great. Uh, would you consider doing a bilateral knee replacement? Would I consider doing a bilateral knee replacement? So um, if by bilateral you mean we do one and then do the other one six to eight weeks later, then of course we do bilateral knee replacements all the time. Um, my guess is that you're asking if we do both knees at the same time. Um, what I've found is that um, patients don't like me very much after we do both knees at the same time because they only get pain meds for one knee for two knees. Um, it isn't the most fun thing to go through, and I understand that. Uh, but I found that the patients seem to recover better if we do one side, let them recover from that, and then go back and do the other side. Um, sort of the you know, uh, snarky answer for why other doctors do both at the same time uh, is they're afraid the patients won't come back, and so the patient's asleep. They might as well go ahead and get both done while they're there. Um, I don't have that problem. Patients are more than excited to come back and get their other side done. Um, and so it, it, I think it's a little easier recovery if you do one and then the other. Um, you know, I, when people say, oh, I had both of them at the same time, I'd never do that again. I would agree. I wouldn't recommend doing that either. Sometimes with partial knees, if patients only have a certain amount of time off, um, we'll consider the idea of maybe trying to do both at the same time. Um, but in general, I try to encourage patients to stage the procedures. Sure. How do you distinguish bursitis versus hip joint issues? How do we distinguish uh, bursitis versus hip joint? So um, in more normal times, we have patients come in, um, you know, take a history, find out where they're hurting, uh, get an x-ray, um, take a look and see, uh, and then do an exam, you know, kind of look and feel and touch and, and prod. Um, for yourself, if you're at home and wanting to try to figure out, basically just kind of put your hand on your outside of your, your thigh bone over here and just kind of push on it. Um, if it hurts, then that may be the bursitis. Um, if you still have a good range of motion of your hip, it's likely bursitis. If you have decreased motion on that hip on that same side, you may have some arthritis that's underlying. Um, so usually if we have a patient with normal x-rays that hurts on the outside and has good motion, then that's bursitis. Um, if they have decreased motion and arthritis on the x-rays, then even if they have the outside pain, it's likely arthritis that's causing the bursitis, and that type of bursitis won't get better until the arthritis gets better. Great. Um, I'm going to ask this one. Uh, can a patient be awake and observed during the surgery? Can a patient be awake and observed during the surgery? Um, you can be as awake as you and anesthesia want you to be. Um, there are definitely patients who have had little to no... Um, sedation um, at the time of surgery and, and actually are awake and listening to what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, they have a, a big blue sheet between the two of us. So um, anesthesia refers to it as the blood brain barrier. So um, the smart people stand where the blood's not. Um, and so I'm at the bloody side of the, the table. Um, and it's just to protect you from, you know, this is a surgery where there's some blood involved. Great. And unfortunately, what that sheet does is blocks your view from what's going on. Um, and so you can't see it. So um, that's, you can be awake for it. Um, you can observe by hearing what's going on. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't see, or, or fortunately, uh, you can't see what I'm doing down there. Great. And um, it looks like we don't have uh, any more questions. So I think we should, um, unless some of our online viewers want to get back to us, um, we are running pretty well right now. All right. Um, well, again, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I hope that you stay safe out there. Um, and as a reminder, we're uh, still seeing telehealth patients um, and select patients uh, in person at the, the Boulder Center for Orthopedics. Um, and most likely, as long as the uh, governor's decree expires uh, as expected uh, in 10 days, um, we'll be back to seeing patients in a more normal schedule. Um, we're doing screening. We're wearing our masks. Um, it's hard to hear me talk in general, so having me give a talk with a mask on wouldn't have been very effective. Uh, but in general, we see you in clinic with our masks on, uh, taking temperatures, um, and trying to make sure everybody's as safe as we can. So um, thanks all for tuning in, and uh, have a good night.